Uh, we'll move on now to uh, Dale Allison. Uh, Dale is going to be speaking to us about comparing like with like, the impossible Jesus and impossible others. I have to begin with an apology. Unlike everybody else here at this conference, I am a Luddite. I have never met or made the acquaintance of Mr. and Mrs. PowerPoint. So I'm afraid that today all you have is just me and my words. The critical quest for the historical Jesus began during the Enlightenment. The instigators were European deists. Unlike the Protestant reformers who rejected all Roman Catholic miracles as unworthy of credence, the deists took the next step and deemed all miracles of whatever origin as unworthy of credence. This included the miracles in the Gospels. But then how does one account for the many stories? That riddle eventually begat all the questions that instigated an academic discipline. Who wrote the Gospels? When did they first appear? What sources lie behind them? What is their relationship to each other? How much real memory do they contain? Three strategies for explaining or explaining away miracles appeared early on. In the 18th century, Hermann Samuel Reimarus, a German Lutheran pastor turned cynic, appealed to the passing of time and bad faith. The miracle stories belong to documents written a few decades after Jesus' departure, when, I quote, very few of those who had known Jesus were still alive. Nothing then was easier than to invent as many miracles as the authors pleased without fear of their writings being readily understood or refuted. End of quotation. The evangelists told tall tales because promotion of their cause mattered more to them than devotion to the truth, and they could get away with it. In the early 19th century, the German theologian H.E.G. Paulus was of another mind. While he agreed with Reimarus that miracles are impossible, he found much more history in the New Testament. His explanation for the miracles was this. The disciples were children of their age, and having been nurtured on the fantastic tales in the Jewish scriptures, they had been primed to turn the mundane into the supernatural. On one occasion, Jesus, seeing a large crowd without food, distributed his own provisions along with those of his disciples. Others, taking the hint and emulating his action, did likewise. And with this spontaneous outbreak of contagious generosity, there was enough for all. Soon, however, Jesus' pious admirers construed the event as an astonishing wonder. Jesus had transmuted a few loaves and fishes into scores of loaves and fishes. For Paulus, the Gospels relate real events over which supernatural explanations have been laid. Miracles aren't fact. They're not facts. They're interpretation. Not long after Paulus, the German academic, academic David Friedrich Strauss essayed a third strategy. For him, the miracle stories were mythological representations of theological inferences. If Jesus was the Messiah, then according to Jewish expectation, he must have been like Moses. And if he was like Moses, then he must have been trailed by the sorts of wonders that attended his predecessor. So Christians fashioned a story of their Lord being transfigured into light as had happened to Moses. In like manner, if Jesus had been the greatest of all prophets, then he must have been greater than Elisha. And if Elisha, according to the Bible, had managed to feed 100 men with some loaves of barley and some fresh ears of grain, then surely Jesus must have done the trick with even fewer provisions and even more people, and that more than once. In short, the religious imagination transformed myth, uh, theological ideas into mythical stories. When it comes to the matter of miracles, the descendants of Reimarus, Paulus, and Strauss have ruled the roost. Albert Schweitzer, one of my intellectual heroes, never once entertained the possibility that anything truly extraordinary took place during Jesus' ministry. Neither did Rudolf Bultmann, a giant in my field, who on the contrary emphatically insisted modern man acknowledges as reality only such phenomena or events as are comprehensible within the framework of the rational order of the universe. He does not acknowledge miracles because they do not fit into this lawful order. 
This is the academic uh, tradition of incredulity into which I was baptized as a budding scholar. I studied Strauss and Schweitzer and Bultmann, and I learned from many other erudite authorities, including my teachers in the flesh, that if I aspired to be taken seriously, so-called miracles were out of bounds. Even when they didn't say this in so many words, their example spoke loudly, don't go there. They never won me to their side. There are two reasons. The first is this. If I was studying mainstream biblical scholars by day, I was reading the marginalized parapsychologists and Fordians by night. I read William James's writings on psychical research, and I figured that if a man as intellectually gifted as he and renowned for every other subject he wrote about took this subject seriously, then so could I. I read the books of J.B. Ryan, uh, who was uh, back in the day uh, the guy who ran Duke's parapsychology laboratory, and I decided that if the only way for his critics to get around some of his experimental results was to accuse participants of cheating, then maybe he was onto something. And I read Arthur Kessler's The Roots of Coincidence and found the pairing of what he called the perversity of physics with the oddities of parapsychology to be illuminating, liberating, and very un -Boltmanian. The second reason that I didn't servilely follow my teachers was purely personal. It's one thing to read books and articles, untangle their arguments, and to do one's best from a distance to decide who's right. It's quite another thing when real life intrudes and supplies evidence for one conclusion as opposed to another. This is what happened to me. I've written about the relevant experiences. Standing before you today, I'll be far less self-indulgent. All I'll say very cryptically is this. I believe that, among other experiences, my education never anticipated. I have on two occasions foreseen in specific detail events before they came to pass one time, a few hours before, the other two weeks before. I also believe, I really do, that I was once present when an object perversely and in the twinkling of an eye moved of its own accord from one side of a room to another. And I'm inclined to believe that a woman three days dead once awakened me in the middle of the night to comfort me. And further that one afternoon, several weeks later, she spoke to me out of the blue, telling me to do something immediately, which I did. Now, I'm keenly aware, I really am, folks. I, this room is strange. This is not my normal environment. I am keenly aware that claims such as mine often evoke within my educated circles strong resistance or even ridicule. Many are reflexively sure that those with claims such as mine must be, even when we have academic credentials, self-deceived, less than rational, or in the thrall of some religious enthusiasm. The attitude of those who believe that miracles and the paranormal have been splintered on the rocks of rationalism is the same as my attitude toward the conspiracy theory that lizard people run the world. Nothing to it. There was a reason I was taught, don't go there. I am, however, impelled to go there, and incidentally can do so publicly because there are no more promotion committees in my future. <laughs> I go there because running from what I've seen would be dishonest. How can I agree with Bultmann that everything is comprehensible within the framework of the rational order of the universe when my eyes contradict him? My eyes. No less importantly, if one opens the right books, as you all know, or if you get enough people to be honest, one soon discovers that there's nothing unusual about me at all. The unusual isn't so unusual. My goal here, however, isn't to persuade you that this or that really happened to me. My goal is rather to invite you to ponder my predicament. What if a historian of early Christianity decides on empirical grounds, not theological grounds, that sometimes people see the future? that clairvoyance is fairly common, that the dead sometimes make themselves known, that additional metanormal claims should be seriously entertained, and even that enigmatic capacity sometimes congregate in exceptional or charismatically gifted individuals in religious virtuosoi. My short answer is it makes everything much more difficult. My open-mindedness about many things doesn't annul the fact that people can, for the sake of a cause, concoct stories out of next to nothing. Ray Morris was right about that. People can also misperceive and turn things into what they were not, 
Paulus was right about that. And early Christians did create and embellish narratives by mixing together ingredients to hand in the Jewish scriptures. Strauss was right about that. The skeptics, in other words, weren't all wrong. We can't ignore them. How might we then proceed? Let me begin to unpack things by drawing your attention to a passage in the Gospel of John. In the first chapter, Jesus calls a man named Nathaniel to follow him. The story includes these words. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, how is it that you know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. Jesus knows all about Nathanael's character prior to meeting him. Indeed, Jesus has, before their face-to-face -face encounter, seen Nathanael sitting under a fig tree. This story, which depicts Jesus knowing things from afar through some unspecified metanormal means, isn't an outlier. By my count, up to 20 such stories in the canonical gospels do this. To put that number in perspective, our canonical sources recount seven exorcisms. In other words, Apparent extrasensory perception appears in more than twice as many episodes as does exorcism, an activity most critical scholars unreservedly, unreservedly associate with Jesus. What should we make of this? One can, of course, dismiss all the texts in which Jesus possesses uncanny knowledge on the ground that we gain knowledge of the world only through the customary senses. On this view, Christians, in order to magnify their hero's status, attributed to him an ability he didn't have. Such dogmatic incredulity, however, isn't automatic for those who judge clairvoyance and telepathy to be authentic, albeit sporadic, mystifying human aptitudes. The great historian of antiquity, Morton Smith, who can hardly be accused of theological bias in this matter or any matter, opined, he believed that Jesus knew the minds of people he met may be founded on fact. Some people are uncannily able to read the minds of others. Unfortunately, even when one believes that sometimes people know things in puzzling ways, this hardly verifies the historicity of any particular gospel episode. That'd be a non sequitur. At the same time, I think it wouldn't be unreasonable, given the abundance of relevant material, to infer that the traditions featuring a clairvoyant and telepathic Jesus preserve the impression of some who actually knew him. The pertinent notices appear in all four canonical gospels and so constitute a pattern across the sources. It's my guess that if something more mundane were this well attested, most scholars would with little hesitation deem it to be historical. If the impression that the tradition here leaves is correct, one need not, I emphatically insist, seek an explanation in religious doctrine, even if Christians typically have. The vast bulk of claims for telepathy and clairvoyance lack a theological or religious context, and the modern debates over whether one should believe in those abilities have nothing to do with religion. A hundred years ago, Ernst Trelch, the famous German theologian, spoke for a multitude when he argued that in pursuing a genuinely modern history, we should always reason from analogy. For him, the present displays a fundamental homogeneity with the past. The key to historical criticism, I quote, is analogy to what happens before our very eyes and within it. That is, agreement with normal, customary, or at least frequently attested happenings or conditions as we have experienced them is the hallmark of probability for all the events that historical criticism will judge to have actually happened or will allow. For Trelch, this precludes positing the supernatural to explain the past because we do not espy the supernatural in the present. No miracles now, no miracles then. While there are, of course, many claims to miracles, we shouldn't believe them. Present experience and the omnipotence of analogy, what an interesting expression, forbid, for buying, for, forbid finding what doesn't, finding then what doesn't occur now. This is, of course, a variation on David Hume's argument against miracle. Miracles. Hume asserted that firm and unalterable experience has established the laws of nature. And since miracles break those laws, we should reject all testimony to them. To quote, the maxim by which we commonly conduct ourselves in our reasonings is that the objects 
of which we have no experience, resemble those of which we have. That what we have found to be most usual is always most probable, and that when there is an opposition of arguments, we ought to give the preference to such as are founded on the greater number of observations. My problem with Hume is not his appeal to recurrent human experience. And my problem with Trelch is not his emphasis on the fundamental role of analogy in critical historical thinking. In these matters, I largely concur. How can we not navigate the past or reconstruct it without relying on the solid knowledge we have in and of the present? How can we avoid projecting the present onto the past? We can't but think analogically, focus from, uh, uh, from the known to the unknown or from the better known to the lesser known. As it is now, so was it then, at least with regard to what's possible. My objection is different. Both Hume and Trelch had in my mind truncated ideas about the present, and this led them to defective ideas about what was possible in the past. These two intellectual giants looked around them and beheld a humdrum uniformity, a stage without strange incursions or mystifying events. Like Bultmann, they were sure that our world eternally exhibits a lawful order and that nothing in it ever rises above the level of today's rational or scientific understanding. I live in another world, one in which puzzling or inexplicable affairs aren't so rare. To my mind, the reductionistic worldview of Trelch and like opinioned others is an illusory construct that has been empirically falsified. It fails to match repeated human experience. The evidence, in my opinion, indicates that Kessler, Rhine, and James were moving toward the truth. Bultmann, Trelch, and Hume away from it. The analogous includes the anomalous. My convictions about this subject mean that when the sources for Jesus often depict him as seemingly reading thoughts or knowing something afar, from afar, my instinctive response isn't, that's impossible. It's rather, well, maybe. Since claims for telepathy and clairvoyance exist cross-culturally and cross-temporally, and since some of those claims are, at least in my judgment, credibly attested, we have no reason to posit that similar claims from the first century Mediterranean world must be, in every case, fictional. On the contrary, if something happens now, it likely happened then. So far, I've urged that if clairvoyance and telepathy are real, it's reasonable reasonable to suppose that Jesus may on occasion have known this or that via some yet unexplained mechanism. The argument is an inference from a family of texts in the Gospels construed in the light of cross-cultural and cross-temporal testimony. But what might one make of a single story that reports something even more extraordinary? The synoptics relate that on one occasion Jesus was transfigured into light. He glowed. The critical literature has any number of explanations for this, all reductionistic. Maybe, for example, the morning sun rose behind Jesus while he stood on a mountain and his sleepy, credulous uh, followers awakened to see the sight. But the reports from numerous times and places of people seeing glowing individuals aren't hard to find. They're just not. Of course, many stories of luminous individuals are beyond doubt legendary. There are, however, numerous first-hand reports of somebody seemingly emitting an enigmatic, unearthly light. Indeed, the alleged phenomenon is embarrassingly well attested. Here's just one illustration from a member of my immediate family. In January of 2019, he and three others had an audience with the late Vajrayana master Kempo Kartha Rinpoche, a Tibetan holy man. Here are my relatives' words. The four of us sat down in front of him, and he poured us tea. As he did so, I discerned a soft white light radiating from him, like a halo around his seated figure. And the longer I looked, the brighter the glow seemed. At first, I thought it was some strange effect of the light coming through the window next to him, where snow was sparkling as it fell. But within a few minutes more, I had no doubt this man was actually glowing. And the glow only became clearer as the afternoon light turned to dusk. After our audience, during which Rinpoche answered our questions and gave teachings through a Tibetan translator, all four of us left in a state of wonderment and joy. We confirmed with each other we had all seen his body glowing. Now, I'm not naive. I have no illusion that quoting such naked testimony amounts to solid argument. 
Many, without conscious insincerity, have persuaded themselves that they've seen or heard things that have no better foundation than their own imagination or their will to believe. The countless sightings of Bigfoot don't exorcise my doubt. Do giant hairy hominids really roam North America? Testimony, including testimony to radiant figures, can do no more than inaugurate a discussion which I can't pursue here. All I can do is share my conviction that study of the copious materials has left me with an open mind, and indeed, to be honest, inclined to think it more likely than not that occasionally, and whatever the cause, some human beings appear anomalously radiant. Having come to this conclusion, not via theological reasoning, but on the ground of testimony, I think we should add to the usual explanations for the story of the Transfiguration another possibility. An odd historical event, a vision of a radiant Jesus, lies behind our accounts, an event that was subsequently narrated in such a way as to highlight the parallels with Moses on Sinai. I unfortunately see no way to push such a proposal over the line from the possible to the probable although the same is true of its reductionistic rivals. The proportion of history to fiction in our story is, as in so many episodes in the canonical gospels, impossible to divine. I am convinced, however, that my proposal merits more than curt dismissal. My field is still dominated by the old antithesis between theological explanation, God did it, and reductionistic explanation, it never happened. But knowledge of the metanormal obliterates that simplistic contrast. One can, on the basis of analogical historical reasoning, be open-minded about the so-called miracles in the Gospels without subscribing to a particular theological program. This follows from the fact that the same sorts of stories appear within different religious traditions, and that those traditions explain and interpret them in different ways. The events, in other words, aren't self-interpreting. I find it helpful in this connection to invoke the old theological distinction between a wonder and a miracle. A miracle is an inexplicable event occasioned by God. A wonder is an inexplicable event occasioned by some unknown cause or cryptic agent. To call something a miracle is to stake a claim about the agent. To dub something a wonder is to acknowledge the reality of a circumstance without attributing it attributing it directly to God or perhaps any agent or offering any explanation at all. For me, there are many wonders. Miracles in the proper sense are another story. Identifying an unseen agent, whether God or some other, is in my judgment a near Herculean task. One can, of course, produce explanations by slotting events into one's religious tradition, and I hardly oppose such attempts. Yet for me, that move takes one beyond the realm of the historian. It rather seems prudent when I'm fashioning public arguments to acknowledge the reality of certain offbeat phenomena while leaving their explanations truly open. And I see no reason why an atheist can't, in principle, join me in this. I'm serious. One can have a gap without a god of the gaps. A fact and its explanation aren't the same thing. One can acknowledge a circumstance while not knowing its cause. Moreover, that some inexplicable things have in the course of human history attracted religious interpretations or been used to authenticate religious ideas scarcely requires that they must do so, that they can't receive other interpretations, or be used in other ways, or indeed be awarded no interpretation at all. Although Jacqueline Duffin, the well-known medical historian, candidly acknowledges that some of the healings in the Catholic records of canonization are astonishing, and without current explanation, she remains an atheist. It causes her no anxiety to join, that really happened, with, I can't explain it. There is a large space full of possibilities between the skeptic on the one side and the traditional Christian apologist on the other. That space has room for the metanormal in general, and it has room for the metanormal Jesus in particular. Thank you. <laughs>